Alex Convery, you wrote the screenplay for Air about the fateful deal that brought together Nike and Michael Jordan. Uh, so to start, uh, what made you decide to focus the story of Air Jordan around uh, Sonny Vaccaro, the, the marketing executive who made it happen? Yeah, I mean, point of view is always like such a critical question, right? And and who the protagonist of, of the film is going to be. You know, it, it it's one of those ideas that... Um, you know, it kind of found me, but it found me in pieces, right? I, I was sitting there in the early days of, of lockdown watching The Last Dance and saw that that short clip in, in the doc about the Nike deal and, you know, how unlikely it was and how Jordan wanted to go to Adidas and Nike never should have signed, you know, never really had a chance of signing him. And, you know, as as someone who looks for ideas like that, I, I was thought, oh, that that's really interesting, you know, kind of worth looking into. And, the more and more research I did, um, you know, finding Sonny as as kind of the the point of view for the audience of the film was really interesting to me because Sonny was kind of like Nike himself, Nike themselves in in the competition, right? And that, you know, he was this kind of backroom employee at at Nike, and he was the one that had the kind of driving idea of bet everything on Jordan. Um, so for me, just in terms of like screenwriting 101 tension and stakes, that was always interesting to me, right? Because you always ask yourself, okay, what what stands in the character's way? And for Sonny, the answer was everything, right? Not only were Adidas and Converse there, but Nike didn't even really want to sign Jordan, right? So within his own company, Sonny is having to convince everyone. And then obviously you have the Jordan family on the other end of it who are very skeptical as they should be of Nike. So that all of that just seemed really ripe for drama and tension for me. Um, and then, you know, the, the you know, there's more to it in that Sonny had been kind of not cut out of the story, but but had become less and less kind of front and center as the years passed and he left Nike. And I just thought, oh, there, there's kind of like an untold version of this. And and it just always seemed like, um, you know, a, a, a fun way into the story. Uh, and how much did you go in knowing about, you know, basketball and uh, like the the industry of, of Nike and, and the sneaker industry or like and how much of that did you have to research? Well, I feel like they always say, you know, every good story has some sort of personal connection. And for me, you know, I'm a kid from Chicago who grew up in the 90s. So, you know, the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan part of this was easy. You know, that was my childhood. Um, and I'm a big sports fan in general. Obviously, like the nitty gritty business of Nike is where I needed to do the most research. Like I had kind of known the very, very background of the story and and that, you know, Michael and Air Jordan is kind of what elevated Nike to being less of a jogging company and more of, of you know, an athlete first um, sports company. Um, but no, I, you know, I, I had to do a ton of research um, from, you know, uh, books on Michael Jordan. Uh, there's a lot of great books on Nike. Obviously, I read Shoe Dog to get more perspective on on Phil Knight. And then, you know, just really like researched and and scrounged every corner of of the internet possible to find background on the deal. Um, and ultimately, it just, you know, it ended up being kind of cobbled together from, from I mean, hundreds really of, of, of different places and sources. And then obviously, once the script had, had, um, sold and and we were we were uh going out with it you know i was able to meet sonny vaccaro himself and and that became a whole other you know kind of source of of text for for the film and and having firsthand perspective like that was was ultimately invaluable uh, and having that firsthand perspective does that you know you know it, it's invaluable but is, does it also increase the pressure since you're writing about these these real life figures who are who are still of course with us yeah, no, of course. I mean, you know, it was definitely validating in the research and that, you know, we got most of, you know, the timeline and the meetings that happened, like all of that stuff was was pretty accurate. But, you know, obviously, once the door shut on those meetings, there's no like written record of them, right? And there's no firsthand account of like what the Nike guys were doing in their off hours. So it was it was invaluable to talk to Sonny and hear from him, you know, oh, Rob Strasser wouldn't do that, or Pete Moore w wouldn't wouldn't say that, you know, like the little personal details, which ultimately I think, you know, kind of make characters. That part, I mean, you know, there was no better source for it, and um, 
it was such a kind of unexpected joy of, of the process was getting to really know Sonny and, and kind of walk down memory lane with him, you know, and, and, and just relive this. Um, it was just such a, you know, obviously a huge moment in his life, but ultimately we were writing about his friends, you know, and like, I, I think that really comes through in, in, in the final film and all that relationship building um, just was taken to the next level, being able to, to, to have Sonny on board. Uh, and of course, Michael Jordan being, you know, essential to all this, this mythic figure in sports, um, you know, and yet, you know, while we spend a lot of time with his mother, like we, you know, we don't see him like head on and and in the film, yeah. um, like wh where did that decision come from to, to kind of, you know, keep, you know, to not, to not depict M Michael Jordan centrally? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different layers to it, right? Like the easy screenwriting 101 answer is that, there was way more tension the less you saw of Michael, right? And you want it. I I was hopeful that the reader and ultimately the audience would would feel the same way Sonny did, which is like Michael Jordan is the person they're trying to gain access to, right? So the further and further you are from him, the the more and more uh, tension there is. So um, that was you know a decision that was made very early on in the script, and then ultimately you know, as we got into pre-production and, 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 you know, making the decision of, of whether to show Jordan or not, you know, Ben really believed that you either really had to show him early on and, and, and make him a, uh, you know, big role in the movie or, you know, do what we ended up doing, which is, um, you know, really only depict him through footage that actually existed, you know, in a lot of ways it was kind of out of respect, you know, we were lucky that, that, Ben was able to meet with 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 Jordan uh, ahead of production and kind of receive his blessing on the movie and um, you know really get notes on 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 certain things. Um, so we, you know I think ultimately we just felt it was most respectful that we weren't going and making the Michael Jordan biopic right. This is a small part of his life and um, you know we wanted to respect that and and you know let that story be his to tell um, if he so chooses. Um, so that was, you know, that that was a decision that was made early on. Uh, now the film started as a, a spec script, um, and you know, but then it makes the blacklist, and then you've got, uh, uh, you know, Ben Affleck directing, and you know, what what is it like to have all of that happen on on? I, I believe this is your first produced screenplay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was surreal, obviously. Um, but, you know, you work in, in Hollywood long enough, you, um, you know, you, you I've had to rewire my brain to worry less about, you know, results and, and just focus everything in on the process, right? Um, you know, although this is my first produced screenplay, I have a, uh, you know, long, long uh, uh, list of, of scripts I finished that, you know, I've never been produced. But, you know, each one of those, like, taught me something different and, and got me to a different place in my career. So it's, you know, that's one of the can be a frustrating thing about being a writer, you know, is the decision to actually make a movie is, is not your own. But, you know, once you kind of embrace that part of it and just focus on the writing itself, um, you know, you, you you start to stress less about, uh, you know, it getting made as this, you know, kind of like finish line of, of whether it was successful or not. So, you know, this one I really went into thinking, gosh, no one's no one would be crazy enough to make this movie, you know, in a way that that freed me to take some chances on, on, on the page and, and really focus on the script as a document to be read first and foremost. And um, in a funny way, I think that's what kind of attracted people to the script, you know, is kind of for the first time, it felt like I was writing with full intention, you know, and, and, and was just so convinced this would just live as a, as a document that, that I wanted to make it as readable as possible. Um, and, um, you know, once Ben and Matt got involved, obviously, um, things started moving very quickly, but, you know, the more and more you work, the more and more you learn, like, you know, sitting with Ben and Matt and, and, and breaking the movie, it felt, you know, like being back in film school in front of a whiteboard, you know, it's like the, the, the process is, is still the same. Um, and that was one of the great joys of this was, um, you know, the, the, the joy of creation, uh, and, and the work itself, um, you know, we're all doing the same thing, right. We're all sitting at final draft, just <laughs> typing away. Um, and then, you know, that was freeing in a way. Well, I want to congratulate you on air, um, and all of the, uh, attention and praise that has received up to this point. And, uh, thank you so much for talking with me about it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Kelly Freeman Craig, you're the writer and director of Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, an adaptation of Judy Bloom's famous book. 
Uh, now you actually reached out to Bloom directly to try to get the rights. Uh, what made you decide to connect with her that way? You know, um, uh, well, first of all, I mean, it was the only way I knew how to, you know, it, it was, it was my, my way of just like making that long shot. And, um, uh, I basically, I had, I started to reread all of her books right after I, I had made my first film, The Edge of 17, and I was thinking about what to do next. And I started to think about the authors who had most impacted me. And she was literally number one on that list. I mean, in, in, in so many ways, she's the person who turned me into a reader and a, and a writer. And um, so I started to reread her books. And when I got to Margaret, I just was like so swept away and particularly the last page, just like, I was just bawling. I was just like walking around my house trying to figure out what happened to me because um, it just, it just hit me so deeply. Um, so I wrote her, I wrote her an email, never, you know, never thinking like it's, it's Judy Bloom. When you write Judy Bloom an email, like you don't think she's really going to write back. Um, but the next day I had, I, had a, a a response in my inbox so um and you know re reading the book um does it mean something different to you reading it as an adult than you know when you were younger yes that was actually one of the things that happened to me when i when i reread it um I, there were so many things that struck me when I read it as a kid. It just felt like, oh my gosh, somebody, somebody gets me. Somebody is like, like has a window into my life and is like writing down everything I'm going through, which was such a relief at that age, like an age where I think you can feel really isolated and like the only person who's feeling all the complicated things you're feeling. Um, but then when I reread it as an adult, what happened to me was, I was so interested in the mom character and the grandma character. I, I'm a mom. So, um, so, you know, when I read, when I read it as a kid, like the parents didn't, I, I didn't register at all. It was like, they were like furniture, you know, who cares? <laughs> but, um, but as an adult, I was really interested in, in the little seeds that were laid in there. And, um, and so I wanted to, part of what, you know, what happened when I adapted it was really thinking about, each of those characters and if you lived if 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 you really sort of like dug in on them what you would find um and you know was there any sort of trepidation about like making any you know significant changes or expansions or or, or like sort of doing anything to this text to to kind of adapt it for oh. the screen <laughs> so so much trepidation <laughs> um I, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, in a lot of ways, because so many people grew up with the book, it's like a Bible. I mean, it was like passed around like that um, when I was a kid. I mean, every, everybody read it and talked about it. Um, so, so I did feel like, I don't know, yeah, it feels like adapting a state, a sacred text, you know? So it, that was, that was really, um, uh, paralyzing at first to sit down and and try to figure out how to how to adapt it but um but what i what i eventually came to is is it really my job was to deliver the spirit of the book and you know and make a film that made you feel the way judy bloom makes you feel even as it even as it colors outside the lines of the original text um, and, you know, one thing that uh, uh, stays the same is that the film, the, uh, the book was published in 1970. Uh, the film keeps the setting in 1970. Uh, did you think about at any time uh, bringing it to the modern day or the present day? Never, never. And actually, it was it was a good thing because um, uh, Judy Bloom wouldn't have made it if if we had. So, I mean, I. I came to that first meeting knowing um, knowing very clearly I wanted to set it in 1970. First of all, just to be, you know, I, I love the book and I wanted to be as faithful to it as possible. But also for me, I, I felt like my fantasy was that girls and moms could, and, and everybody could see it today and find themselves relating to 
something that somebody is going through 50 years ago that they're going through today. And there's something about that that I think is really connective and sort of reassuring to know, like, you know, you're, you're not the only one. And this has been going on for generations and we're all in it together. There's something about that, that I don't know, just, um, I, I just find reassuring. Um, and, you know, you've had experience now writing uh, younger characters, Edge of Seventeen, uh, Now Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, um, and directing their stories. Um, is it challenging to write from that point of view? Because some, sometimes you see child characters, they're written as either little adults or it's condescending in some way, but like, you know, you manage to thread that needle. You know, I... I, I I like writing younger characters and and particularly I guess this this age in life where you're transitioning into adulthood and you're sort of I, I don't you know you just feel like you're you're figuring out who you are and um I I I have to say it's not hard for me to access like my inner adolescent like I, I don't it's probably something I should take up in therapy <laughs> but um but it's really it's like very close to the surface and so it's so it's actually like easy for me to write from that place um and also I think that like like I really feel like I I've come of age over and over again in my life like I not just at that age when I was a teenager, but you know, when I was, when I became a mom, that was like a real binary for me. That was like the most distinct before and after. And I had to really um, I, I dis rediscover myself in a lot of ways after I became a mom. Um, and yeah, any big life transition feels to me like that. Um, and you know, how is it different, uh, an, an experience as a writer to uh, write an original script versus adapting one, especially one uh, of this, uh, of this caliber? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say it's actually, it, it, it's more similar than it is different because, because the process requires you to reinvent things for the medium so it requires the same it requires the same um originality or for for you to like bring your own instincts to the writing um in the same way that you do in an original obviously you have a you have a template um but um but it feels like it's very much the same the same muscle um, and what kind of reactions have you gotten uh, to the film from fans of the book, especially uh, now that now that it's it's been out? Oh, that I mean, honestly, that's been the most exciting part um, is, you know, is, is to see how much it's been embraced. Um, it was really important to me that that people who grew up with this book felt like this really uh, was an extension of that book and felt like it really delivered the spirit of it. Um, and also it's exciting uh, to see people who have never read the book um, discovering it. Do, do you think people who haven't uh, read the book and are discovering it, do you think they're inspired to to pursue the book uh, after seeing the film? I, I've heard that a number of times, yeah, yeah. Um, and the film is produced by uh, James L. Brooks, among others. Um, you know, you've worked with him now here, uh, you know, a couple times now. Um, what's it like working with him? He, you know, of course, he has this incredibly extensive resume, um, and and you know, to to get to work with someone who of of that caliber of career. Uh, he is absolutely the best in the world. I mean, it's by the way, I like I. It's so wild to me that I like he is the person who most influenced me and made me want to be a filmmaker and the fact that I get to work with him and learn from him and then Judy Bloom is the person who turned me into a reader and a writer so the fact that like I I got to make this film with two of I mean literally my biggest heroes um and they both, they both like, you know, they say never meet your heroes, but they both like you meet them and they exceed your expectations somehow. Um, so um, yeah, it's been, it's been really 
wild. Very surreal still. <laughs> Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on the film um, and uh, all the attention and, and success you uh, achieved from it. Uh, thank you so much for talking to me about it. Thank you. John Carney, you wrote and directed Flora and Son about a really complex parent-child relationship uh, that starts to really come together through music. Um, and being a musician yourself, uh, what made you want to bring that love and knowledge of music into feature films as you've done like multiple times now? I think I'm just trying to capture the lightning in a bottle that I experienced as a truant schoolboy back in the 80s in my parents' house going through my brother's and sister's re record collection, you know, at one o'clock in the afternoon. My parents are at work. It's an unusually sunny Dublin day. Stevie Wonder is on the turntable. I've I've stolen two of my brother's cigarettes. And this was just, a, you know, a an ongoing source of kind of heaven on earth for me for a couple of years when I was in high school. <clears throat> and I think I'm just trying to recapture that magical feeling that music had for me back then, you know, as a kid. And it doesn't have the same sort of potency now as an adult. Uh, but I sure as hell, are, I'm repeatedly trying to sort of relive that through these movies. Uh, and I think one of the hardest things to depict in film is is sort of the creative process of of making art. Um, how, how do you approach that uh, in 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 showing us uh, the inspiration and the hard work that goes into it? I mean, I don't find it that hard, probably because I'm not necessarily great at art myself. So maybe I found that, that I'm quite good at portraying how art is made or something like that. Because, you know, I don't know. For me, in a way, great artists are probably too concerned with creating art than documenting how they do it. And so I would put myself in in, in the bracket more of sort of, um, I'm not a hobbyist because I take my work seriously and it pays the rent and stuff. So it is my job. But I... I, I I I love making music. I don't make it particularly well, but I but I kind of know how to make it. And I love looking at people making music and figuring out what they're doing. And I wonder if musicians are, happen to be uniquely good because maybe they've got a tool in front of them or something, but there's stuff on YouTube that I will go into or there's certain teachers that I've met along the way who have, you know, in in five minutes, brought to life how something was created. There's great clips on the New York Times web, web page about the creation of songs. They're just so fascinating the way musicians can talk. Because I think a painter can't talk the way you can when you've got a guitar or a piano to sort of illustrate what you mean. You can play a chorus to somebody to, show, you know, it's different with painting or poetry or something like that, or the, the higher arts. But with music, you can sort of go here, this is what I mean and play and and I just love watching that happen. And I love filming my made up versions of watching people create uh, music. Uh, and how did you uh, conceive of this central character, uh, Flora uh, in particular? Like what was the inspiration for her and, and this relationship with the fish son? Um, I mean, I thought that, um, I didn't set, set set out to want to make a story about a mother, uh, or you know, a, a, a mother with a you know single mom with a with a kid or anything. I never sat down with sort of that that criteria, you know, a thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to do another musical film. I didn't want it to be a a, a romantic love story, and I think I, I'm not sure if I would have gotten away with it having done that a few times now. So I didn't want the main A story to be you know, a romantic story between a girl and a girl or a boy and a girl or a boy and a boy. I wanted to be, I wanted to explore how, how I could maybe take the sort of the quality of a romantic relationship and the poignancy of, of you know, a movie relationship, but with, with music the way I had done in these other films and move that into a sort of a more familial platonic arena, um, you know, and see if I could get the same emotional response 
to a non-romantic relationship. Um, and and then I, you know, was thinking about my own mother and uh, how much, how significant she was in terms of my musical career and life. She's somebody who bought me a guitar at a time that I was really, really wanted it. She didn't get me a couple of presents that I really did want when I was a kid, like a BMX bike and a pair of roller skates one year, which I still hold very close to my e to my ego, my fragile ego. But she did get me the bass guitar I asked her for. And I interpret that now as sort of like good parenting in that like now as a father, where your kids are asking you for something every day. And I can, funnily, it's the only time in my life that I could afford presents for my kids. If I had kids 10 years ago, forget about it. They'd be eating granola. But um, uh, granola is perfectly good, but you know what I mean? Um, so I was sort of, I interpreted that as some as as like that's the gift he needs, the other stuff he doesn't need so much, and I sometimes now look at my own kids and I'm like you don't need that and that that, but it's important to know as a parent when they really need the thing they're asking for, and to 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 get that right, which is something that my mother really did with uh with music for me. Uh, and you know, you wrote the songs for the film. Uh, does uh. Does sort of the songs come first or does the story uh, come first? Like which which kind of, or, or do they sort of develop in tandem as you're creating? No, no, no. I mean, they, they kind of develop in tandem, but the, the, the story has to be leading, you know, if they're, if they're tracks that the, the story is ahead and the songs are catching up all the time. Um, so they're written during the same creative period, but but I think the script, I think it's important as a filmmaker, you know, who deals with music and stuff, to write the script and the story and the characters first and then the songs. Because otherwise, I think if you write the songs first, I think the movie is going to become more of a jukebox thing where you're just joining, you know, you've got these dots and you're joining them together. It has to be, first and foremost, a, a, a film that should be watchable on mute, you know, without without any of the songs there. Um it's obviously better with them but but it doesn't depend upon them you know it's not a, it's not an album it's a it's a movie first and foremost so it's got to have story and narrative and plot and character and all of that and then the songs are kind of knocking around in my head and I've got verses or slugs in the script where I'm like that's definitely a song not sure what it does yet but I'm pretty sure she's going to sing it maybe it's acoustic guitar I'll put it away I'll send it to Gary Clark or you know, and he'll come back with something or I'll send him one of my ideas half formed, which he then turns into something nice, uh, which is kind of the way our relationship works. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, right now it's it's important for me to. Uh, and when I look at good musicals, it's like the dialogue is as good as the musical as the songs here. And also the songs are as good as the dialogue. It's like the two things are just perfectly. uh serving each other incredibly well you know and, and kind of married together in a, in, a, in a very cool way you know things like guys and dolls are singing in the rain where it's like reams of great you know they don't skimp on really smart writers and great dialogue in those movies they they're not the best musicals aren't frivolous and silly and broadway or whatever you know however people look at these things they're a sophisticated movie you know musicals are as sophisticated as any as any drama um, and, you know, between writing and directing and, and music in your uh, life and career, do you have a primary passion as an artist? Does one of those stand out as uh, like the most important uh, creative outlet for you? Um, I think probably music. M music is more therapeutic to me. You know, as you can see very conspicuously in the back of shot, I have a piano and there's a few guitars lurking around. Fender, Fender, uh, uh, Telecaster there. Um, that's, but music is therapeutic and, uh, beautiful and, and romantic to me. Filmmaking, I have to say, I, I probably, if I had to do without either one, I would probably do without music. Um, because movies are intellectually so stimulating or good movies or, you know, or good TV is so intellectually stimulating and so helpful in terms of 
you know, when films are good or movies and TV are good, they they kind of help you navigate stuff in life. I'm not sure music does that to the same degree. Um, but music is a it's kind of like, I don't know, it's 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 a wonderful time in my day each day that I sit down and play the piano or work a song out. It's kind of meditative. I think my blood pressure goes down. It's a private, lovely time on my own. Um, but movies, movies are movies. That, you know, films are whatever you want films to be. They, they, there is, there is, uh, you know, the, the, some of the best things in my life that ever happened were was, you know, in a movie theater or my parents' kitchen watching a VHS of like Casablanca or Guys and Dolls or you know, uh, an Ingmar Bergman movie or or a Billy Wilder comedy. Well, uh, congratulations on uh, Flora and Son. Um, and uh, thank, thank you. you so much on uh, saying, thank you so much for talking with me about it. Thank you. Sammy Birch, you wrote the screenplay for May, December about uh, a marriage that started uh, years earlier as, as this tabloid scandal. Uh, now you said the character of Joe, who was underage when the relationship began, uh, you know, was of particular interest to you. Uh, how challenging was it to delve into such an unusual life experience and mindset as a writer? Well, I mean, I felt really connected to to the character of Joe right from the beginning. That kind of was the the seed, um, and it's yeah, it's, it's difficult subject matter. It's really sensitive subject matter, but I, you know, character is sort of the anchor for me when I'm telling a story. So, you know, I had to feel like I understood, understood him right from the beginning to even want to, to write the story. Um, and, you know, it, it's, uh, this is sort of, you know, similar to the Mary Kay Letourneau case. Uh, how much, you know, research or prep work went into writing this? Or, you know, how much did you want it to kind of hew to the real story? And how much did you want this to be its own fictional story? Well, I mean, I did, I grew up in the 90s also. Oh my goodness. And I, um, uh, all of these tabloid stories really were so in the water I feel like I never I don't remember learning them it was always you know Mary Kay Turner, OJ Tanya Heidi Fleiss the, you know these these figures were so prevalent that I really didn't do any research at all um right from the very beginning you know th that was the sort of the seed and the jumping off point but it was important to me that this was a fictionalized version that the you know I any of the detail I, I it was it was um it was really no research it was just kind of um jumping off there a couple like that and feeling you know a way that it made sense to me that you know these people kind of forming independently of how I could see that happening um, and the story is is told through the point of view of uh, Natalie Portman's character, an actress who is uh, uh, going to turn this into a movie. Um, what what made you choose that as sort of the entry point into this story? Well, I mean, we always knew we wanted it to be a um, set twenty year. I mean, that was like the initial spark. Was like, okay, we're setting. We're 24 years, 25 years later from this scandal when um, their youngest kids are about to graduate high school. And this idea of being an empty nester in your mid 30s, you know, young enough to start over that kind of um, that idea, always setting it right before graduation. And then having um, our entry point be this like TV actress, you know with something to prove <laughs> like it, there was, it felt inherently comedic as well as also very helpful, you know, that she's filling this kind of um, investigative reporter role. So, so that the story is, is very fragmented. We're kind of learning as we go and we get to see all these different lenses as she talks to people, almost like a detective kind of thing. Um, and you mentioned the the humor of of the film uh, there. You know, it, it's a very funny film at times. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, how do you balance that kind of 
you know, the intensity of the subject matter sometimes and with also the kind of, you know, so, sort of comedy that comes into it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, a lot of the balance has to do with what the jokes are, or what the what the root of what the punchlines are, who's who's at stake. You know, I think um, a lot of the humor is, you know, because we're coming from this actress, there's um, elements that are maybe more acerbic about Hollywood, about this true crime machine you know, that we're part of, of taking these 90s stories and, and retelling them. Um, and some of it is, is coming from a place of it being so uncomfortable and so dark that there needs to be some release, you know? Um, but, but the, the character of Joe, um, and what happened to him, I mean, that, that's very protected, you know, he's, he sort of exists in, in the safe space within the story, um, and that was obviously very intentional. So it is, it's about calibrating, I think, that balance. Um, and, you know, it's directed by Todd Haynes. Uh, how, how did he uh, come on board the film and, and what was it like uh, working with him on it? <laughs> Amazing. I mean, it was, um, it was a crazy journey, really, but it, the first producers were Jessica Elbaum and Will Ferrell. Um, who are wonderful and they got it to Natalie Portman. And so she said, I want to play this part. And then she sent it to Todd um, Haynes, which was um, surreal as you can imagine. And he is just, I mean, as, as a, a person a lot, you know, I, I love his work. I've always, it's meant so much to me um, just as a fan of a film. And then, um, he's amazing. He's really, he's as smart and kind and funny as you could ever hope someone to be. And, and getting notes from him are like poetry and there's so much, um, generosity of spirit. And he's also just so, uh, thoughtful and bold, you know, it's really cool to see that up close. It's, it's very exciting. Uh, there's a particularly memorable moment uh, in the in the film where uh, Natalie Portman uh, recites this letter that uh, uh, you know Gracie wrote to uh, Joe um, uh, back during their early uh, relationship. Uh, what was it like writing that and 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 really kind of digging into uh, Gracie's point of view uh, with that? Yeah, I mean, it's it. I like. I like writing that monologue. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really there there's a nice um amount of space or you know canvas on the page, but um that moment is so it's so key. You know, there's like a climactic element that kind of braids all three of their stories because I feel like, you know, not only is it sort of Natalie's performance or, or Elizabeth's performance as Gracie as this actress you know you kind of get the sense that this is her this is her hitting the high you know this is her flying a little too close to the sun um as Gracie but but yeah we get to we get finally some amount of evidence of the truth um of Gracie's point of view at the time like this relic this this clue um and we learn not only how um, dishonest she's been about some of the things, you know, we we have confirmation, but also, um, you know, you see the portrait of a very disturbed person, which is not necessarily a surprise, but it's it's like almost you can see a a fracture in the mirror, a mirror crack, where you can kind of start to see it more up close. But I also, I think the way Todd shot that straight to camera, and especially when you see it in the theater. You know, I always get that sense like that we are Joe in the past. We are Charles Melton's character as a young boy, like the amount of pressure that's being put onto us um, in that in that monologue is, is so um, it's so disturbing. So, yeah, it's kind of um, keeping all those things in mind, you know. <laughs> 
Um, you know, previously in your career, you've worked in casting. Uh, do, does that influence uh, how you write at all? Like, do you do you imagine actors in the roles as you're writing, or you know, knowing that they might be played by someone else in the casting process, or you know, how does that how does that work? You know, I I, I was the the thing that honestly I think has impacted my writing the most was when I was a casting assistant and I was the person making the audition sides, um, and there were so many day players that or the people you know that one line that really didn't need to be in there <laughs> and so that's that's a way where i think there's like it's practical but um i try to make sure that every role really has a has a reason for being there even if it's small some of my favorite line readings in this movie are are day players with one line that just kind of come in and say something funny but that's kind of that's really the the main thing i think well, uh, congratulations uh, on your work on this film. Um, and thank you so much for talking with me about it. Thank you. I'm Gold Derby editor Daniel Montgomery here for our Meet the Experts panel of film writers. I'm joined by Alex Convery from AIR, Kelly Freeman Craig from Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, John Carney from Flora and Son, and Sammy Birch from May, December. Uh, now, the subject matter of your films varies quite a bit, um, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so first off, uh, in general, what attracts you to a subject or a character or idea that makes you think as writers, now that's a story I want to tell. Uh, let's start with uh, Alex. Character, <clears throat> excuse me. It's always character, you know? Like if the character is not there, it doesn't matter. You, like no one goes to the movie to see plot. No one remembers plot from the movie. You remember character. So. That's always the question for me, you know, who's the character, what's their journey and, and, you know, why do we care about them or what's interesting about them? Um, you know, and if that's not there, then I mean, in my mind, you, you, you don't have a movie. Uh, Kelly. Uh, yeah, I, I think also, um, for me, it's, it's always sort of like feeling into a character and finding what it is they're like, they're scared about under everything and then like as soon as I can find that pain that thing that hurts then then I feel like I have a a, a beat on them and everything kind of everything kind of grows out of that John I'm still trying to figure out figure the whole thing out I have no idea <laughs> um, you know I, I I don't know what it is when I look at movies that I get so excited about. Um, is it character? Maybe. It's certainly not plot. It's it's uh I think it's acting. I think I think actually the thing that I get most, we have a thing in our house, myself and my wife, who's an actress, where we watch a movie, and if it's very good, you know, like the screeners that come in the post, or like you're excitedly put on a new movie. And 15 minutes into it, I pause it and go and make tea and want to talk about how good it is. And she's like, can we watch the rest of it? And I'm like, but what if it gets bad? <laughs> Which it's like, it's like, it can do films. and But like right now it is just so poised to be the most important thing in my life now. And often it goes downhill and you don't get that experience. Remember when we were watching films when you're educating yourself when you're 16? So you're watching the best movies in the world and they're all delivering incredible stuff. That doesn't happen so much nowadays. You know, you don't put some like a half on there or, you know, go, oh my God. Often you get a great first 10 or 15 minutes and then it's like, yeah, I'm going to bed. So, but I think for me, it's probably a mix of character and story and then a killer performance. Sammy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... I certainly character is what um keeps you attached to the story i think you know there is that intangible quality i don't know i like i feel like i read something patricia highsmith said something like ideas are like you know birds like you have to intentionally grab one or they just kind of fly fly by you something like that i'm sure i'm butchering it but something to that effect um, and, you know, what's, uh, you know, being being writers can be, uh, a, you know, especially writing for film uh, can be a relatively solitary uh, uh, 
process a lot of times. Uh, do you have an ideal environment or you know any rituals for getting into the creative mindset for writing, uh, Dom? Um, I'm good for about three hours a day. And it's usually in the morning, weirdly, which I don't understand. Uh, I drop my kid to school and I continue on the road down to a little cafe down the road from my house. And I open the laptop and I read two or three little articles, sometimes that are pertaining to the thing I'm writing, maybe, or, or loosely, you know, whatever, David Brooks in the New York Times, or there's a couple of Irish Times journalists or Guardian folks that are synthesizing the world so I can digest the craziness with my first cup of coffee. And then I'll open the laptop and about two or three hours, it takes me to 11 o'clock, I'll go outside for the first of my one cigarette a day. Um, and after that, it's all downhill from there. The whole day just disintegrates into a series of why am I writing this? And I'm awful and despair. And I go for a cycle to try and forget it or jump in the sea or go for a swim. And then the next morning, it's like, okay, it's not as bad. And I do another three hours and that's the way I roll. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm really deadline oriented. I wish I had, you know, that kind of Benjamin Franklin daily thing, but I, I'm, um, a lot of times, obviously self deadlines when I, you know, I wrote this as a spec and I was writing specs before. Um, but yeah, I just, there's, it's like a, a torture a little bit, but also, um, you know, you get into that space. I, I write a lot in the middle of the night. Um, and I, you know, I wrote this one in the coat closet of our old apartment because that was the only space we had, but it was really tight little, we had like a, put a desk in that's like an airplane little tray. <laughs> and so that was, that had a nice kind of, you can't leave. Did you eat there as well? Did you get little, did your no. partner bring you snacks? Candy sometimes, but there was a, it was about the size of this laptop, so there wasn't much room. <laughs> Alex, uh, yeah, I I'm like a you know right after the first cup of coffee in the morning is when I I feel like I now do my best work. But it's funny, you know, like I mean when I wrote Air, I saw the day job, you know, so it's like you don't always have that luxury. So it's the question is you know, when you can steal an hour or two, how can you get creative immediately? You know, cause there it's, it's writing is hard, you know, and it's just like, there's so many bad days and you kind of have to deprogram yourself from remembering those. So for me, like the quickest cheat is always returning to something that I love and something that like inspired me to begin with, whether, so it's just like, you know, pulling up YouTube and, and, you know, yeah, watching a scene from all the president's men or, uh, Butch Cassidy or Michael Clayton or, or, uh, you know, Lady Bird or any of those those great movies, you know, or could even be reading like literally a paragraph of of a great short story, you know, like, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm always reading like the White Album by by Joan Didion or going back to, um, you know, like Michael Chabon books I loved as as a kid or Stephen King or whatever, you know, it's just like that starts your gears turning and it's like, OK, like, you know, whatever inspires that in you, which is kind of unknowable in a way, I, I do feel like it, it gets the creative juices flowing a little bit and, um, and, you know, kind of gets you on your way. Like you just need to get the fingers moving. That, that typically is the hardest part. Kelly? Yeah. Um, I always wish that I had like a, a balanced process. Like actually, John, when you describe your process, I'm so envious that you're like, I write for three hours and then you live your life. <laughs> but I, I feel like mine is, um, it's like I have to eat, sleep and breathe it. So it's like I just go underwater and it's, it's like 10, 12 hours a day. Often I'll check myself into a hotel for a week and I mean, literally not leave and order room service and I mean, um, and just have to immerse myself and just like drop off the map. Um, I'm going to try that for my next movie. 
That sounds it's, great. It's, that sounds like I heaven to me. Don't recommend it. <laughs> and and kids can't come over. That is that one yeah, of the right. girls your children. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no, you are gone. You are on an, you are on the moon for all yeah. anybody cares. Um try that. so um so yeah, because I find for me, I find that like as soon as I step away for a little too long, it's so hard to get back. So yep. it's like I have to keep the momentum going um because it's just it's 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 like the first the first time when you're you know you're trying to get your gears going that i find the hardest um and you know we're on the uh the the thankfully the other side of the writer strike and so now you know writers and filmmakers and and yeah and both strikes were over so everyone can talk about their work now uh the way they couldn't uh for a while. Is that something that's really exciting to be able to talk about your work again? Um, or, or you know, do you look at it and go like, oh, now I have to talk to bozos like Daniel Montgomery? Uh, <laughs> oh, no, it's really exciting. It's really, um, it, it's, it's amazing. And now that the actors can too, you know, if it's been, this has been a wild ride. I mean, for me, it was, our movie played at New York Film Festival and the strike ended like 24 hours before that. So it was like, get on a plane tomorrow. I mean, it was really a wild <laughs> hit the ground running kind of thing, but I'm, I'm very grateful to talk to you and you guys. <laughs> Kelly? I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just happy it's over and everybody's back to work. So. <laughs> Alex? Yeah, I had kind of like an opposite experience where where Air came out in early April and it was just super go, go, go and screenings and the premiere and South by Southwest, all of which was awesome. And then the strike happened and it was just like, you know, going from 100 to, to, to zero. Um, so it's interesting. And now it, it's interesting to kind of like have that period of reflection and, and look back on it. I, I feel like you know, that distance from it always clarifies your your thoughts a little bit. You know, the other part of it is like, I'm just like an introverted writer. So, uh, you know, <laughs> all the talking and 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 all of that, like I is outside of my comfort zone, which is good to be out of, but also, um, you know, I found myself looking around being like, I just, I wish I could be writing right now, you know, which is a funny feeling. And um, yeah, obviously happy the strike is over, happy that, you know, we, we got a good deal and, um, you know, it was, it was, it was a long summer, but, but it, it was worth the fight, uh, you know, more than ever. It's, um, you know, screenwriting, I feel like has always been kind of like a perilous career in terms of consistency and, and feeling like you're on stable ground. And, um, you know, since streaming kind of took over the business, I, I think that's been more so the case than ever. So, um, you know, we, we fought the good fight and, and I think came out stronger on the other side and, um, you know, we'll continue to do so. Like the big thing, like it's one thing to do it for the 150 days when you're out there. It's another to like, you know, have to live by that on, on a day by day basis. And, and a lot of times, especially as a feature writer that comes down to like the individual. So it was, it was really clarifying, you know, to, um, to, and, and felt like, you know, a ton of solidarity and, and, and unified and, in, in you know, our goal just to do what we love. And sometimes the thing that makes us bang our head against the wall, but, but we still love it despite that. John? Hmm. I hate it. I hate writing. So I was really happy. I, I got a little boat and I just, <laughs> I, I went out fishing and sailing and thinking and I didn't write a word. And I did then when the actors went on strike, myself and some actor friends rang each other and we were like, I'm going to just work with you when, when this is all over. And we came up with tons of really great ideas that we would do together. And then the strike ends and we were all like, oh, fuck that. Just let's go back to how we were before the strike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, now, if you were, uh, you know, to teach a course on, on writing, uh, you know, is there any one film that you can think of from the past where, you know, you'd be sure to, to you know, that, that, that would be a great example of the form? Uh, yeah, what do you think, Kelly? Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, um, it's hard to just pick one. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with, uh, Jim Brooks, who I work with, uh, his film as good as it gets is one of my favorite is one of my favorite films. I think just, I think, I think just like the tonal 
high wire he's on. It's just, I, I, I also like, I just love that tone. That's funny, sad. Um, and I just, I think nobody does it like him and it, uh, in terms of tone, he's, he's a masterclass. Don? Um, I mean, I probably sound a bit pretentious if I went back to like the, 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 you know, move, like the golden period of Hollywood or something or like Swedish movies or something like that. So I'll say in terms of, in terms of like writing quiz show is a movie that I come back to a lot in terms of like, I think movie writing is like, you know, a, a Richard Linklater movie of two people talking, character A, character B, and you put a bunch of them together and you've got a movie. And what I realized to do, not that Richard Linklater movies aren't terrific, and I'm speaking of the trilogy ones, but like, it, it's not rocket science to get two people to talk to each other on screen. And that's the movie. And I've done that a couple of times. It's comforting and it's kind of easy. Um, there's something so challenging about bringing so, there's so many lead characters in Quiz Show. You know, it's cross-cutting between all these stories, but it's not arbitrary. They're all leading towards the one court case and the one moment. And it's so funny. And it's, if you watch the Quiz Show stuff on YouTube or read, read the actual testimony of the trials about the Quiz Show thing, they're incredibly boring. They're yep. long-winded courtroom stuff in wide shots. None of the characters is particularly compelling, but the story is brilliant, obviously. And I think it was a New York Times story that the quiz show was based on. But however it was turned into drama with so many characters and so much plot to get through and so much story to get through and so much tone and it's a period movie and you've got this giant cast it's like I look at that film and I'm like, it's just it's a it's a master class of uh, of of form and character in terms of script writing, particularly. Sammy, really hard to pick one movie, but I guess I guess I'm gonna say Badlands. I feel like there's such a simplicity. Um, it's it's such a beautiful portrait. It's I mean, speaking of tone, it's so. It's so funny and so beautiful and so heartbreaking. And um, those voiceovers of Sissy Spacek's character, I think that's just, you know, one of the great examples of that. So I think that's what I would say. Uh, Alex? Yeah, those are all great ones. Um, you know, in terms of writing specifically, I feel like the two screenplays that really changed how I looked at at the the form itself were um Michael Clayton by Tony Gilroy and um Lincoln by Tony Kushner um you know you're taught in film school like a very at least I I was and I I love film school but you know you're taught this very specific mode of screenwriting as um you know the screenplay is a blueprint for a finished film and only write what the camera can see and you know don't don't inject uh you know your own thoughts in into the stage direction and then you know, you read Michael Clayton and it's like, man, that, that breaks every single rule you're taught in the first half page of, of the script. But there's so much voice to it that that you can see the movie on the page. And that ultimately is, is the goal of a screenplay. And same thing with Lincoln, you know, that's um, a really audacious project. It's, I write about true stories um, a fair amount. So to like tackle a huge subject like that and, you know, that could be a you know, ongoing HBO maxi series. So like, how do you just turn that into, you know, a 150 page document? It's it, it, the structure of that film is, is to me super, super in, in instructive and enlightening in the fact that, you know, they pick the right story to tell and the characters go on a journey in that movie, even though you don't start when Lincoln was born and you don't end when he dies, you know, but you still feel like you get the the fullness of the story. Um, and obviously Tony Kushner, just a, a genius. And, and, you know, I could read his writing forever. So reading those two scripts really, you know, I right out of film school at, at like, you know, 20, 21 or 22 or however old I was, um, that really changed things for me and and taught me a lot of lessons of 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 voice and and tone and um you know crafting character and, and structure 
Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to talk with me about your work. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, all your films are so uh, fascinating and unique uh, to each of you. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks thank so much. you so much.